Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us at the Chow Chak Wing Museum. Before I introduce our presentation this afternoon, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the University of Sydney and the Chow Chak Wing Museum is located on the grounds of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. The Chow Chak Wing Museum and the University of Sydney wishes to pay our respects to the traditional owners and to acknowledge their long-standing relationship with the land in which we meet today. My name's Craig Barker. I'm the Head of Public Engagement for the Museum and welcome to day two of National Archaeology Week here at the museum um, and the second of our lunchtime talks. Um, just to let you know that there will be a, a, a talk at uh, midday um, every day for the rest of this week by various academic staff members from Archaeology at the University of Sydney and I encourage you to come along. If you're unable to make them, we are recording all of these talks and they will be placed on the Chow Chak Wing Museum uh, website uh, in coming days. Um, and that includes today's talk, although I will preempt by saying you'll see a recording of Annie speaking um, because her presentation does contain images of deceased people, so we won't show the PowerPoint. I should also mention in passing too, uh, given that he's in the room, uh, but uh, there's still very, very limited, it's almost sold out, uh, tickets on Thursday night to uh, Professor Keith Dobney's uh, lecture um, on uh, archaeological sciences as well as part of National Archaeology Week. And for those in the room, just in passing, given that today is also International Museums Day, because everything's always on at the same time, at two o'clock I'm joined by a number of colleagues from the Museum Studies Program uh, to moderate a debate on the future of museums in the 21st century. So uh, for those of you here in the room and free this afternoon, um, I invite you to go and get a drink down at the cafe and then join us again at two o'clock. But archaeology. So um, our speaker today is Professor Annie Clark, who's been at the University of Sydney for almost two decades now and a beloved member of staff, Annie is. Um, Annie is Professor of Archaeology and Heritage Studies. Pr prior to joining us at Sydney, um, she was at the Australian National University and Charles Sturt University before that. Annie's research interests are broad and uh, include the archaeology of Arnhem Land, the archaeology of cross-cultural engagements and particularly the relationship with colon colonisation, rock art and mark-making practices, ethnographic collections and objects, and of course Annie has worked uh, with uh, many items in the Maclay collection and with Jude Philp here um, on a number of ARC projects over the years. Community archaeology, which is what we will primarily hear about today, and narrative and archaeology and heritage. Annie was also one of the uh, key drivers behind the quarantine project, um, one of the major uh, pieces of research done here on the archaeology of Sydney by the university. But today, Annie has very kindly offered up 45 minutes of her very busy schedule to talk to us about her more recent work on an island that you've been involved in for quite some time now. Um, ladies and gentlemen, will you please welcome Professor Annie Clark. Um, thank, thank you, everyone. Oh, I just got to switch myself on, sorry. OK. Um, before I start, I'd also like to acknowledge that we're on um, the Gadigal land of the Aora Nation and that uh, I pay my respects to knowledge keepers, law, law men, law women, um, and to uh, peop you know, Indigenous people, past, present and emerging. But possibly uh, more importantly, uh, for the context of this talk anyway, I actually really want to acknowledge uh, the Groot Islanders, right? So without them and without their generosity and without their duty of care, going for now, what, some 31 years, I wouldn't be in front of you today. I wouldn't have had the career, the life, um, the opportunities without their, without their generosity. Um, and what I want to do today is really talk to you about uh, the community-based archaeology that I've been doing on Groot now for 30 years. I first went there in 1990. Um, sadly, of course, as with many um, community-based pro or community projects or co just in communities generally, uh, all the people, bar one old lady now that I worked with in, from the 1990s has passed away. But I'm now working with the next generation. So I'm working with the kids who are now in their 40s, the grandkids, and um, we also have the great grandkids who come along with us now on, on field work. So it's turned into a multi-generational project. 
So that's been, I think, one of the really uh, strong and important parts. And, and of course, over that 30-year period, things change. The way that it started out as a community-based project, it became uh, transformed uh, in, the, in this re most recent period into a kind of community-driven project. Um, and we're about to enter a new phase where it becomes a project of co-creation, where we will actually develop the project, the outcomes, the processes, the narratives uh, in concert with, with the community. So I'm going to show some slides. Um, and what I really want to do, more than anything, is actually introduce you to the folk that I work with, the families that I've camped and lived with now for 30 years, um, who ring me up and want me to help buy the Toyota um, because, you know, <laughs> I can work the internet. Um, and, uh, you know, just in a sense, give, a, give us a flavour of that kind of process of working with people for many, many years. Uh, but I would ask, too, that nobody take um, phone shots while you're here, too. Um, I have got permission to show photographs of people who've passed away from the Anandiliagwa Land Council and from the family members, but I really don't want these going further uh, outside of this room, if that would be okay. And also, um, you know, the sites and the rock art that I'll show, none of it is obviously secret sacred, but again, um, they're not images that I would, pref I would prefer that they stay in this room rather than um, further afield until we have, um, you know, publish them and all, all that kind of thing. So, I mean, I think one of the things to think about in terms of um, doing community archaeology is that all archaeology is, you know, it can be about discovery, it can be working in the labs, but fundamentally archaeology is about relationships and it's kind of, kind of relationships that you create uh, when you're in the field. It's whether it's relationships between yourself and your co-workers, but importantly, you've all got to think about that archaeology is always carried out in somebody else's back garden. You know, whether it's a very large back garden of Central Australia or a back garden of, um, you know, bits of Arnhem Land or here in Sydney, you know, we're always in somebody else's, um, on somebody else's country or somebody else's land. And so developing those relationships across time um, and for the co context of the project is really a really important aspect of, the, of archaeological practice. And I think as archaeologists, you know, I hope there's some, there are one or two maybe younger folk in here, um, kind of developing your own ethic of practice, I think, is a really key element of doing respectful uh, archaeology and, and also um, ethical archaeology. So in a sense, that's what I'm going to try and talk about a little bit today, um, because the project has, over 30 years, of course, changed and um, people's attitudes to things have changed, uh, people's attitudes to photographs have changed over those 30 years. And I'm happy to, you know, if people want to ask me a question while I'm running along, please, please do. Um, I'm not sure how much time we'll have to actually go through questions at the end. So I will try and introduce you to all the folks that I've worked with. Um, so this is Groot Island, big island, lots of little islands. It's an archipelago. It's in the Gulf of Carpentaria, in case anybody's geographically challenged Keith. And um, uh, it's, so it's up there in, in the Northern Territory. It's a maritime culture. Um, and interestingly, uh, given, you know, one of the endless questions is like, you know, when did people first get to Groot Island, whether Groot Island the island or Groot Island the kind of rocky outcrop on the edge of the Lake Carpentaria in the Pleistocene. But the, the myths, the creation myths are all about the beings coming across shark, shark ray, stingray, uh, shark coming across from the mainland, crossing the water, jumping onto different islands and cutting channels through, oh, wrong one, sorry, uh, cutting a channel, ah, rats. Um, cutting a channel through the Anurugu River, all through here around Central Hill. This is Yantarana, he's another uh, important being, and create, coming out, creating the lake, uh, and creating all the features. And also Yantarana, who's the ancestral being, he comes from the mainland, and he comes across the water, he jumps across, uh, he comes to Bickerton, he goes to Connection Island, he, he lands, on, lands here in the north of the island, and all the way along he drops his... Drops his children off, and they become the rocks. Um, and it's those, it's Yantana who actually, or Iningoyua, who actually creates uh, the plants, the animals, the features of the landscape, and gives people the knowledge of all the food plants, the animals that you can eat, um, and creates that, that part of that really important Groot Island landscape. And today, uh, he sits here, uh, it's an area that, you know, in English is called Central Hill, when the missionaries came, it was called Mount Ellie. Um, 
So today it's uh, Central Hill or Yantrana, and he's a sort of prominent, prominent sandstone outcrop on the top of the uh, on top of the hill, on top of the plateau, basically. So if anybody's been to Arnhem Land, this is kind of like a kind of remnant of the um, Arnhem Land escarpment. Uh, that's just out on the, you know, the eastern extremity, if, if you like. So it's not as, not as high as the one in Kakadu, but it has similar features. It's sandstone, there's rock shelters, there's outliers. And it's a landscape that is, um, even though currently the, the archaeological dates are really recent, maybe 3,000, 3,200 years, it's a heavily painted landscape. So there's rock art absolutely everywhere. So um, I went there as a wet behind the ears archaeology PhD student in 1990 um, and uh, I know I must have been so young I was only about 10 right because you can tell right um, and uh, okay so it was 1990 so how do you actually make contact with a community in the 1990s today you'd write an email right or maybe contact people on Instagram I don't know I went to the university photo photography um, place and I had some headshots taken I wrote a letter, and I used, uh, young people, I used a cassette tape, okay, you know, one of those things that, and I recorded myself, so I actually recorded like a letter to the community saying I was going to come to Grid Island, I wanted to, interested in finding out <clears throat> about the history and working with community members, um, and you know, and I said, I, you know, I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to, I wasn't interested in taking uh, skeletons away or doing, working in places that I shouldn't, but I, I wanted to be guided by the community. Um, and it turns out uh, that it went to a community meeting and uh, it kind of caught people's interest. And so I did get the invitation uh, to go there. Um, and so in 1990, I, d I made a preliminary trip. I did, next year I did about 12 months field work. Uh, next year I did another three or four months field work. So I spent a long time in 1991 and 1990 and 1991 working um, with people, doing, um, Community-based archaeology, which at that point in Australian archaeological history was a really recent initiative. Um, it hadn't been something that uh, it had been developing through the 80s in a sense that there'd been uh, Indigenous uh, First Nations voices kind of talking to archaeologists about, about the way that they practiced archaeology, about the assumptions of practice, about how you practice, you, the assumptions that you could go anywhere and dig or collect or survey without doing not just consultation, but actually negotiating how you did how you did the work. You know, many people were doing consultation, but again, it's a, it's a very often it, in those days it was not at a kind of necessarily always a very engaged or deep level. Some people did do that, um, but again, there wasn't the kind of framework in which uh, community-based archaeology was was to be placed. And then there were a few of us who kept coming out of some of those um, processes and debates. I think started to think about different ways of working. For me, um, it actually it kind of came out of the way that people interpreted my questions about where did the old people live, what did they do, where did they camp, what did they eat, can you show me? Um, and so the kinds of places that people started taking me to weren't necessarily the kinds of places that I thought as an archaeologist I should be looking at. They could have been a campsite on the beach, um, it could have been a series a, a, a place where people camped, but there was no material evidence. And so then we started talking, and it was about conversation, really. I said, so what about up over there where those rocks are, you know, where there, there might be some of those rock paintings, like the ones near Anurugu, which is the old mission. And so, you know, through those kind of conversations, we ended up sort of doing, going to places that people would tell me where the old people would live, and the places that I thought might also have a kind of place the kind of places where you could get a deeper history um, beyond kind of community memory. So that kind of process was very, um, it just evolved as a way of um, going about the country and you know, was, people started to get interested in going back to places because again, people had been moved out of country and off country by the 1930s onto the mission, onto Umbacumba and would only really go bush and close, often close to town um, on holidays or weekends, school holidays and weekends. So, you know, people going back into sort of these places was, again, um, I had a car, I had petrol, it worked. Um, it had four tires and two spare ones, which is always an advantage uh, when you kind of do it uh, sort of like 
indigenous way, which is like with no tyres, no spare tyre, no oil or very little petrol. So, um, you know, we, I had a working car and we'd go out constantly. And so I started working with a whole range of different families. Um, this family here, uh, Russell is still alive, but he's uh, not not very well. Mary, unfortunately, is my age, uh, 25, and um, but sadly, you know, she passed away five or six years ago. So, you know, again, it's that sort of thing that happens in communities where people um, don't have a, such a long, you know, the, the long lifespan as uh, as we do with our better nutrition. Um, and you know, she died of sadly of renal failure, which is you know has happened happens quite a lot, and that's what Russell is also struggling with at the moment. But the kids, I caught up with them when I went back. But so I were I was there by myself, um, so I was very reliant, and as I said, you know, on the community to help me do that work. Um, and people were, you know, Mary was always taking the kids out of school to come with me because the kids were back in the bush. We were doing, we'd work in the morning. And then we'd go and get food, go fishing or get catching shellfish or uh, digging for yams, depending on the season. So people would help me do the excavation um, and do the sieving, looking at stuff, telling stories. Um, so that's Mary and her husband Paul both are now passed away. And then there's all the kids. And we'd go out on the weekends. So part of the, I guess part of the thing was that if, if, if people helped me during the week, um, on the weekends I'd take people out um, to where where people wanted to go to go and get shellfish or go fishing, go and get yams. So in a sense, I was embedded in that kind of community practice as well by doing the kind of research that I did. Um, you know, I'd often take 40 people out in the bush in various vehicles. Um, so there's one of these camps at a place called Mangala, which I'll show a photo of in a minute. Um, again, this old man's passed away, but he came and worked with me. Um, other families, people would... Uh, bring the kids out to learn, to be on country, to talk about um, kind of, you know, different things that uh, the old, their ancestors would have done. So it's Polly and uh, Cheryl and Sheena uh, kind of making hand stencils at one of, the, one of the rock shelters, actually one of the ones I dug. So they've added some rock art to that. Um, and it's this, old, this couple here, Nabby and Polly, who I kind of uh, worked with uh, closely. Um, and it's now their kids and grandkids that I'm, I'm working with uh, in, in the present kind of project. It's my colleague Ursula Frederick, who I've worked with there since the mid-90s. Um, she's uh, only 12 years old there, I think, as well. She's being taught how to make um, damper by, by Edna. And Edna and her sister Jill were both married to Claude, um, Claude Mamarika, and he was... Um, a senior man for Umbacumba, which is uh, one of the major settlements. And again, um, they'd take us out onto their country or to Claude's country uh, and you know, help us do the, do the sieving or do the excavation. The kids would join in. And so in a sense, it becomes this very much um, multi-generational, family-based activities. Uh, and those kind of relationships slowly build up over time. You know, you go out two or three times. And often we'd be out in the bush for two, three weeks at a time, or maybe three months occasionally. We used to count with Nabby and Polly for three months at a time around the around the Salt Lake. So, you know, those kind of long-term, really engaged, embedded kind of experiences uh, change the kind of way that you work and change the kind of way that people um, perhaps see you and, and work with you. So in those days, it was very much about me waiting till people were ready to go out, um, We'd negotiate how we did it, you know, how we, how we, where we would work, how we would do the work. Um, families would come and join us uh, on weekends. So uh, people, if they had a job in those days, people would come out and join us on the weekends. So the weekends very rarely do research and in many ways. So that's kind of one of the ways of doing community archaeology. It's not just about hitting the landscape, hitting the archaeology, doing what's important to you. It's about doing what's important for the community in that context of doing, of doing research. And so, uh, but over time that changed. So then, you know, when I was, went back in the mid nineties after finishing my PhD, um, I did another couple of uh, six month periods, sorry, oops, on Groot Island. Um, 
So people would ask me where I wanted to go, like what did I want to do this time? Are we going to go here or are we going to go there? So that kind of dialogue and those conversations change over time. So one of the areas that we really wanted to work in was um, in terms of the questions that we were asking. So the, the research I was doing was really about contact archaeology or cross-cultural, the archaeology of cross-cultural interaction, focusing on the relationships between Macassans and the Indonesian fishermen uh, who came to Australia as we now know, probably from the mid um, 15th century, 16th century, up until 1904, um, when uh, government policies changed and they were banned from coming. But they would come to Australia every wet season and come and get trepang, uh, sea cucumbers, process them on the beach. Aboriginal people would work with them. Some Aboriginal people sailed off to Indonesia with them as well. So really uh, intense periods of uh, that kind of interaction and uh, social sort of social relations of exchange. And so where, what we were interested in looking at, uh, you know, because it's very coastal activities, you know, how was this represented? Was this represented in rock art uh, in the inland area? So we started to work into the central plateau area. So working with old man Nabby, we would we'd actually do survey work, um, except we had to do it at like sort of high speed because everybody gets a bit bored. So Prod Ursula, who was taking the photographs, um, was always kind of running along behind trying to, <laughs> trying to catch up. Uh, but we found this very large rock shelter, which we've been subsequently been back to. Um, and again, um, you know, every, Nabby working with us, um, the kids were there, some of the grandkids were there. Uh, and again, it's just, it's kind of, whilst you're doing archaeology and recognisable archaeology, it's done, it's done within a sort of family-based family, family -based context. But the, one of the extraordinary things about Groot, of course, uh, as some people would be aware, is the corpus of uh, contact cross-cultural um, rock art. So uh, some of the rock shelters show uh, the maritime culture of the Macassans, uh, the prows, contents of the prows, so like this one at Ayuawa. So, you know, they have a standard iconography, uh, but this one um, is one of my favourites because not only have you got the people, and they're always like this, they're kind of waving, it's part of a, and you see this in ceremony, so um, it's kind of both arrival and departure. But the other thing that you see with a lot of these is you, you see the rigging, you see the superstructures of the boats, but importantly, and this is something that Ursula and I have written about, is you actually see inside the boats, you see the goods, the trade goods that the Macassans brought. So you'll see the dugout canoe, you might see the fish, you might see turtle, you might see the pots that they bought, or you might see the, trapang cook, the metal trapang cooking pots as well. And, the co and what we've written about, um, and now it's become sort of standard, part of the standard lexicon, but at the time it was we pointing out in a sense that... Um, what you see in the paintings is the whole of the boat. You see the superstructure, you see the below the water stuff, and you see the inside of the boat. And it shows you that indigenous folks who were working with the Macassans had a really intimate knowledge of, of those boats, of, how, of the internal structures, what were on them, how they operated, the numbers of people. Sometimes you can actually see uh, the captain, Bungawa, which is a Macassan loan word, who's standing, and he's always larger, and he's standing, uh, standing at the back see the rigging, some of them have quite complex rigging. Um, whereas the European boats are often not shown in X-ray style. Uh, they're often quite sketchy, uh, particularly at this site uh, of Mangala. And again, it's t t so, you know, one of the arguments that we've made is that that shows that the Macassans were kind of kept at, um, the Macassans were part and parcel of everyday life when they were there. Europeans and European boats were viewed from a distance, so far less intimate knowledge of those of those structures. Okay, so I would need to. So the Holly, for example, which is one of the um, mission boats, there is a man with a hat, which is how Europeans are always shown, and they've all got their hands hands on their hips like we stand, right? Um, so, but again, you know, there's not much detail uh, on that on that boat. So fast forward. So I did I did all this work. Um, with the community, and then, you know, life and the universe takes you off elsewhere. And I didn't really get back to Groot. Um, ended up doing other kinds of projects, Blue Mud Bay, uh, in the early 2000s, which was uh, the big project that ended up getting giving people sea rights, okay, across um, 
the land between high tide and low tide. It was the Blue Mud Bay decision that was made through the High Court. Finally, sea rights, you know, were granted to people. So I did that for a number of years with Pat Faulkner, who's uh, busy panicking about something in his office, I think. Um, so I didn't get back for 20 years. And then I got rung up one day by somebody saying, oh, hello, I'm, I'm Nikki. I'm from the Land Council. Um, and um, look, the kids are doing archaeology at high school on Groot, and um, they're doing Egyptians. And, um, and, but we think maybe they should perhaps be doing something local. Is there somewhere you can, you know, we've got all your stuff, you know, is there somewhere you can send them? And um, I said, yeah, look, go down to this site, uh, Dadarunka, the one that I showed the first, first picture of, right? Um, where I was with Mary and Russell and the kids. Uh, it's called Edor, Yedor, um, uh, and it's uh, two sisters, the rocks actually, two sisters leaning together. And it's a very prominent site, south, not very far south of Anurugu. It used to be just off the main road and was well sighted. There was a track so you could get to it easily. In the interim, of course, the mine has gone strip mined all the way down that west coast. It's a mess, to be honest. Um, and when they tried to take the kids down there, they couldn't find it. They could not find the track into this really important um, both story site, but also, uh, you know, one of the slightly older sites on Groot Island. So that just started a whole range of conversations about um, taking people back to, to country, relocating places, um, synthesizing information, and returning uh, both, no in a sense, a knowledge repatriation project. So taking uh, all the materials that I'd excavated, the photographs, the archives, back onto country, back to people, um, for them to make the decisions about its long term, a long term future. So, the Land Council, and I've been very lucky that Anindiliagua Land Council funded two seasons of field work. They paid for my teaching, um, they paid for my uh, field expenses, uh, including helicopters. Okay, so, you know, very exciting. But, um, it was the first of that first for me experience a little bit in blue mud bay i mean that was a kind of community initiated and driven project but for you know coming out of Groot island it was kind of the start of like turning in a sense the projects around from something that i had initiated to something that the community um and the land council um were interested in and keen on on pursuing so um my messy, former messy office, the one I got booted out of late last year or earlier this year. Um, we packed everything up, uh, put it on the barge to Groot Island, because of course, you know, everything has to go via barge um, from Darwin. So things bobbed around on the sea for a while. Um, those are all the, I think it was 69 boxes of materials went back. Uh, they landed at uh, Aliangula. We got the trailer. We took them to um, the field office at Anurugu, at the old mission. It's an old, one of the old mission buildings. It's actually on the Northern Territory Heritage Register. Uh, and I was given an office there uh, to set up as my lab, which I set that up. So there's all the boxes. Um, and the Land Council funded um, for, to, funded, uh, gave me some funds to employ people to, to work with me. Uh, but the first part of the repatriation, there's kind of this is kind of the, one of those kind of magical things that happens when you do this kind of work, is that um, I talked to the anthropologist Hugh Bland, and it was about actually returning images. So one of the things that one of the points of, as I come to uh, when we look at the 2019 work is that everything was done on um, film or slides, right? And you could only ever take like two of everything or one of everything. You just never had enough imagery. You had to take the film. It would often get baked in the sun. So, you know, you're always worried about film and running out. It was hard to get supplies of decent film onto Groot Island in the, in the 90s. And so we didn't have many images, um, but we, you know, there were, and, but there were a few images. There were images of people. And what I've realized in the intervening time, like when I first worked there, uh, showing pictures of people wasn't a, a thing that you would do. It was not, um, people didn't want necessarily uh, want to see pictures of people who'd passed away. With Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook, uh, Pinterest, you name it, 
people love photographs now. So it, the change in those 30 years is that people want photographs of their, of their um, parents or their grandparents or their auntie or their uncle. Um, and I, I discovered, uh, I'm still discovering, that in, in many ways you can't have enough photographs. I think I probably took over 2,000 photographs, reprinted and gave them back to people over that six months. So what I first did was all the families that I worked with, I, um, I printed up a whole bunch, made little albums, um, and then ran around the community trying to find everybody that I'd worked with or family members. And so um, I made little albums uh, and, gave them, and gave them back. So, um, and again, it was a really important way of reconnecting um, with everybody. So, oops, uh, James's head's cut off there. <laughs> I don't know why that happened. Um, but meeting Gloria again, uh, Lily, her sister, James, her brother. And so just doing that with the, the photographs kind of, again, um, I mean, people cried, um, you know, to see, the, to see those photographs. Um, other people who I'd not met before came and asked us, you've got photographs, so that's my auntie, that's my uncle, those are my cousins, you know, can you, can you give us those? And of course, people use them today to decorate the walls of their houses. So they've got photographs up in their bedrooms or on their lounge room walls. Um, then, the, then it started to be like so the little postcard size. Can you do those ones a bit bigger? Or I'd like, um, you know, like I want that, I want Nabby and I want that, you know, mum and dad, I want them in a, I didn't say triptych, but I want, you know, three, right? I've got to have them together and then I want dad on that side and mum on that side and I want them in those big A4 or maybe bigger. So <laughs> uh, back back to Kmart, you know, with um, got bigger and bigger, right? So um, so it's quite interesting. So people use those photographs, um, uh, you know, uh, constantly uh, but through, uh, you know, for their own sort of um, family family memories and family histories because, again, they, had, they didn't have access to photographs, right? People didn't have cameras, people didn't have the money, technology to take, to take photographs. So um, with the Land Council, so who was I going to work with? Of course, it has to be the Yantana family because most, most of the sites I was working on um, I dug a lot, but I'd not actually got around to sorting everything and finishing off the sort of analysis of all of these sites. So um, the sisters came to work, came to work with me. Um, so there's uh, Shirley Yantana, her sister Gloria, uh, Faith and Amy. They're, they're, they're sisters. Those two are sisters. Um, they would call themselves cousins, but they're sisters uh, in kinship way. And uh, because their mum. Their mum, their dad, mum and dads were brothers and sisters. Okay, so um, very close, cr close family in that in that sense. So the two brothers married the two sisters. Um, so they call each other um, sisters rather than cousins. Uh, but so they all came and worked, um, and it was you know it was one of those wonderful kind of I don't know three months where we're in the lab doing sorting of the archaeological materials. Um, people would tell stories. Uh, they told lots of stories and, you know, a, a memory about their, their, their parents because all the work, a lot of the sites that, that were analysed, that they dug, some of them had been there. Sometimes it was um, their parents that had, that had helped me, Nabby and Polly. So it became this kind of really engaged uh, process of taking material back onto country, analysing and sorting it on country, and then actually this, in 2019, going back to many of those places. So you know, in a sense, kind of a, a repatriation pro project that's about not just repatriating the materials, but the memories, the knowledge, the stories, the photographs. It was a kind of package um, of working in, in that kind of context. Um, and in fact, this lot are so much, they're really good at sorting, um, way better than students, right? So, um, you know, uh, um, and also really interesting discussions around um, memory, what people used to eat, Trying to remember names for things, um, names for shells, you know, shellfish that people perhaps are less familiar with um, and don't eat so much these days. Stories about macassans, when we'd find little bits of beads or glass, um, the fish bones, the stone artifacts, bits of charcoal. So, and then the kids would come along and um, help as well. So, or uh, we'll try to help anyway. Um, so it, it was a really busy kind of again. Social people were dropping in and out became sort of part and parcel of everybody's daily life to come in and um, join in. 
uh, for the sort of family and the extended family. So again, I think it's really hard. You can't really underestimate those kind of relationships in a sense and those experiences that build up. And then people talk, of course, and um, more, pe more people come around and, uh, and on it goes. As part and parcel of the project, um, my colleague Ursula Frederick was in the middle of her decra uh, on art and archaeology, so partly about um, how art is mobilized through art practice and archaeology kind of mobilize, mobilize each other. And so one of her case studies was Groot Island. So she was doing both documenting the repatriation project, but also um, creating artwork. So she made some uh, cyanotypes while she was on Groot, which has now been part of a, a, an exhibition that's just finished in Canberra, uh, and photographs as well. So. Uh, so, you know, there's a sort of another, uh, kind of another aspect to the project. And then the last, one of the last things we did in nine, 2018 before we left was, um, okay, so the elder, elder sister here is um, Jennifer Yantana. She's a, been a ranger um, and her husband, uh, Philip Mamarika. So we organized, Nabi and Polly had both passed away uh, in the intervening period when I hadn't been back to Groot, which is very sad and we couldn't get there. You know, it's just, uh, wasn't possible. So they organized for us to go to um, the cemetery um, and visit uh, Nabi, Polly, and um, the brother, Wanella. Uh, and um, again, it was just one of those amazing kind of occasions. And one of the things on, you know, uh, First Nations or Groot Island, same in Arnhem Land, when de you, you kind of decorate graves with plastic flowers. So we went to the shop and bought billions of plastic flowers. Um, we cleaned up the graves, uh, took the leaves off, raked them, made them clean, um, and uh, you know, and then had sort of like a kind of little family ceremony. It was actually a really beautiful and moving occasion. So um, Jennifer whipped out. We got there, and you know, she said, "Annie, you tell those ladies, you tell those girls to clean up that grave." I said, "Clean up the graves." I, I, you know, depending on, I think I'm meant to tell everybody what to do. Um, he said, you tell them that they should come here and look after their, their parents' graves. So anyway, we, we cleaned it all up. And then out of a backpack, a little backpack comes a um, Bluetooth speaker. I'd only just bought mine, but, you know, Jennifer was way ahead. And she'd chosen these kind of beautiful songs off uh, YouTube to play. So um, I think I was probably bawling my eyes out by that, by that point. Um, but, you know, different song, one for Polly and one for Nabby. Um, one for Wanella, and so again, it was just a really nice kind of nice family occasion. But um, they'd all felt that it was really important for us to go and visit them uh, in their final resting place, and that's all of us outside the lab. Uh, and so, though in 2019, went back um, to do field work to continue with the sort of repatriation project, but sort of in a different context this time. This time it was about taking people back to places where we'd worked, to re-photographing um, in digital format so that we actually have a bit more data. Uh, but mostly, again, about reconnecting uh, the kids and the grandkids uh, with the places uh, in their country that A, they don't go to very often, or if at all, many people hadn't been to any of these places, and to see where we'd worked um, and find out a little bit about the kind of work and the history that we'd done. So, um, we, you know, we were going to re relocate and redocument places uh, that we dug in the 1990s. Um, we were going to carry out more survey work around Central Hill, partly um, to continue trying to find and look at where imagery of Macassan boats, you know, how far inland it goes, how far into the kind of Central Plateau, um, and what what kinds of, uh, I guess, uh, rock art that people are, or imagery people are choosing to take into these kind of inland areas. Um, also trying to find sites that might have the potential for a slightly older date. Um, I I'm not convinced they exist, but, you know, I'm happy to go and have a look. But also it was really just taking people back uh, and engaging the younger generations in um, the history and, and sort of the idea of like looking after places, conservation of places. So we had a helicopter. So there's um, me, Bo, the helicopter pilot, Shirley and her sister Rebecca in the back there. Um, and we got sort of flown all over the island, which is pretty awesome, I have to say. Um, 
so we'd find a landing place uh, and then we'd walk through country that's like this, okay? So we had to have pink tape, so otherwise you get lost. <laughs> Especially me, because I'm short. Um, uh, but you can see what it's like, right? It's not exactly easy to, to, to get through, right? So it's, it's kind of thick bush, thicker bush. Um, uh, and then when I went out with the, everybody to try and get there in the car, uh, many flat tyres later, um, yeah, so it's pretty, it's pretty, it hasn't been burnt um, around that area. When I was with that old fellow, Nabby, we burnt it, and the fire, I think, went for like two weeks. We watched it go across the horizon, and then he took us in in the car after about a week. Um, but for various reasons, people aren't wanting to burn through here at the moment, mostly to keep other people out. Um, that's Clayton, who's um, Nabby's grandson, and uh, we were trying to find the track that Nabby had made, mm, you know, like 25 years earlier. Uh, and Clayton is kind of was so he was a very excitable kind of guy, and um, you know, he said, and this is really one of those again a lovely story that um, he said, yeah, I was trying to I was trying to find that track where that old man had been. He said my grandfather, and he said, and then I just you know I just there, and then I heard him. And I knew where to go, and then we, and then we literally we did find the track. And he was so excited that um, you know he was uh, able to sort of connect with his his granddad um, through that experience of trying to find the old track through through the bush. <coughs> so this is that big site of Unamalawalumanja where we excavated, um, but we never really got to enough time to record the rock art properly. So um, there's us you know, doing that. But we also took everybody back. Pe not many people have been able to come with us, uh, just, you know, we had one car in those days. So we brought people backwards and forwards in the helicopter to come and visit. So that's James Yantana, who's now the senior elder for the Yantana clan, and his cousin or brother, Aeson. Um, he was, they were really excited to, to come there, uh, especially James, because his dad had talked to him so much about it. Uh, Jennifer and... Uh, Philip came in and they talked a lot about the, about the site and um, about it being a lot like a library. That was the analogy they used that it you know it contains all these stories and it's like the images are like a library for the for the community. There's another site called Angwakbuna, um, and again, uh, just a really this is where we Ursi and I worked with Old Nabby and uh, so this amazing. Macassan Prow, as you can see here, it's the biggest one we've seen on the island. It's got like 90 people in it. It's got three different masts. It's got flags. Um, it's got harpoons. It's got you name it. It's got all sorts of stuff um, going on in the on in the uh, in the ship. It's got everything below the hull, including people. Uh, there's boats. There's um, dugout canoes, which were introduced by the Macassans. There's pots and pans and all sorts of things. So it's, it's an interesting site. That's one of the older sites at around 3,000. And then, you know, taking everybody back in, including with the um, newly acquired field tool of the Chihuahua. There you go, Charlie. Uh, since I went to Groot Island, the camp dogs have shrunk. <laughs> Honey, I shrunk the camp dog. First day there, screaming around the corner in the Toyota. <coughs> camp dog, Chihuahua in the middle of the road. And you know the feisty little buggers, really. You know they um, they're not very friendly, um, but everybody has them. So you now have an in, you have outdoor camp dogs, and then you have indoor camp dogs. And so I've never actually done field work with chihuahuas before, so it's a completely new experience. They're really good. They can run up and down rocks. Um, they don't. Uh, they like you wouldn't believe it. They can actually rock climb. Um, I think that one was called Rocky, and the other one Cindy, or my, I think something. I think. Um, and so people have them with them constantly. So it's kind of it's a kind of weird experience. But there you go, um, the, the Chihuahua is the new uh, camp dog. But again, you know, like taking people and taking families. Um, again, just giving a sense. You know, everybody was there. They're talking to the kids about about what was there. Um, you know, just you know, just a really lovely kind of weekend of uh, getting lost in the bush and um, looking at places and talking about. Uh, talking about history and talking about the old, mu as much as anything, talking about their grandparents and their parents. Um, uh, this is a, one of the sites because there's stories about uh, the stone people uh, and they come out and, 
you know, they're kind of scary and they've got big hands and big feet and they've got a name. Um, but Boom Boom Man is kind of what everybody calls calls him. So um, he quite likes young women, right, uh, in the middle of the night. You have to be a bit careful with Boom Boom Man. Um, and then uh, this is Salt Lake, which is the big salt lake in the middle of the uh, on the eastern side of the island where I've spent, I've camped for months and months with the old, old people. And then this little area here, it's called Alada, um, where we've done some excavations. It's uh, one of the, Gloria, it's Gloria's own personal name. Um, and where we found a, a, a site we hadn't found before. So everybody's very keen to go back and do the, do the digging next time we get up there. Uh, it'll probably be a recent, you know, I can't see that it's going to be particularly old, but there's paintings, you can see all the shells on the, on the ground. There's Troyson there and there's Shirley. So again, you know, people were people, people running around on that weekend finding places. The kids were there talking about stuff. And in many ways, that's really the whole point of doing community-based archaeology. It's about that kind of level of engagement as much as the actual kind of discovery or the kind of new knowledge that you might create as an archaeologist. It's really about um, those processes of, I guess, getting people talking about um, and engaged with perhaps looking after those places more more into the future and under you know and uh, it's kind of you know uh, being interested in uh, heritage in a, in in, a, in that broadest sense. And we also did a fair bit of survey work up into Central Hill, and again looking for the kind of Macassan sites or Macass images of imagery of Macassan is a little rock shelter, um, and so it's very hard to see because it's very badly damaged with salt. There's um, fish and things on the ceiling, but across the back here is a whole series of white Macassan boats. Very unusual, just to be all white. Um, they all appear to have been painted at the same time. They're in one style. We actually think it represents a fleet. Um, so again, it's pretty hard to see. Sorry for the uninitiated, but there's um, there's a sail. There's some rigging. Um, there's another sail to the. There's another sail there. And some rigging. Um, the bottom of the boat is kind of there. And then you can see some people as well, just you know, with their arms akimbo. And there was a whole uh, there was a whole um, row of those. So, and this is quite a long way from anywhere that the Macassans would have come. So again, it's like people have taken that knowledge and that memory of that event into and onto country and, and, then, and then painted it. So it's telling us something, again, quite different about um, you know, the way that people are uh, representing their interactions with Macassans uh, uh, away from the coast where all the action would have happened, where people worked for Macassans, where the Macassans set up their trepang processing and camping sites. And so... Um, you know, it, the fact that they've taken taken that into this kind of inland country. And there are actually, as far as we know, no Macassan uh, trepang processing sites in the kind of nearest coast. So again, this information has come uh, from other parts of the island, from other clan territories. So, so I think it's, you know, once we start thinking this through and writing about it, it'll tell, tell us quite a different story about the way that... Um, those relationships with Macassans are represented through um, artistic practice and, icon and iconography. And again, uh, just an example of the kind of <sighs> things that you can oops, the things that you can see in the Macassan. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of Macassan prows through here, tricolored, uh, red, white, and yellow. Um, this one you can see the canoes are really clear. Um, there's some peeps, uh, and then either to, oh, these are probably turtles, I think. So, um, and we do know that the Macassans, you know, not just came for the trepang or the sea cucumber, that they also came and uh, got turtle shell. And there's kind of stories and rituals around the way that turtle shell was handed over. So that uh, people would collect turtles uh, and then leave the turtle shells on the on the beach, sort of lined up, and then the Macassans would um, come and trade for them. They'd also come for pearl shell, for sandalwood, um, uh, as, well, as well as the, the sea cucumbers, and all of this stuff would head back to the um, Indonesian and then further, further markets into Southeast Asia. So, yeah, so that, you know, it's quite a, 
um, is, you know, again, it's slightly water damaged, but it's a really interesting, a really interesting site. And then there's us. So um, this is a, a part of the slide has been taken from a thing I sent back to Groot. So that's us kind of saying thank you. And of course, traditionally in archaeology, we always finish with a sunset. And so that's the sunset. So thank you, folks. Um, has anybody got anything they'd like to ask? If, have we got time? Are we um, Yeah, we're not too bad with time. Anybody want to ask? Anybody would like to ask a question? So perhaps not discovery based in the way that we traditionally think about archaeology and you know the finds and the sites and the digging, but um, in, when you're working in colonial settler countries with First Nations people, you know this is what you have to do really to um, create respectful relationships where you can um, do various kinds of archaeological research. And now I, I would say that because I've worked there for 30 years, um, I go and I'll go and talk to James. Say, James, you know, like we're gonna. Is it okay if we go here? And I'll, you know, and I say, I want, want to have a look. He said, yeah, he said, you can go. You know, you know that, A, that country knows you and you work with those old people. So, you know, absolutely you can go. So in a sense, the kind of relationships change, uh, have changed over those 30 years in terms of the kinds of ways that I'm able to work um, from between, you know, 1990 and 2020-odd. So we're in the process of, creating a project. Uh, it's going to be bigger and Ben-Hur. It's another repatriate. It's kind of based, keep going with the repatriation, but on a, in a bigger way, but also in a community-directed way, because the Land Council um, wants to create um, kind of a cultural industry, you know, for young people who might work with pictures, work wow. with images, work with their existing art. You know, Groot Island art has been in a big di diaspora across the world, like most a lot of indigenous communities. So finding ways of and protocols for bringing this stuff back onto country in digital or real form, training some of the young people to work with cultural collections, as well as doing archeology span um, and co-creating history. So trying to integrate uh, indigenous history with um, kind of archaeological stories and knowledge. So it's going to be, hopefully, um, if we get the grant, um, it'll be uh, quite novel, I think, and innovative in, in using a co-creation methodology. Um, we'll see how it goes. Um, but yeah, so anyway, um, if anybody would like to ask a question, please do. Julie, nice to see you. I haven't seen you for like 400 years. <laughs> Not so much systematically. They take photographs all the time, right, if, if the phone is working. Uh, no, we haven't done that. That's part of the new project. That's what we'll be doing. So there, hasn't been, there haven't been kind of ranger programs where people have been doing... They've got rangers, but they do animal surveys. So people haven't really engaged in the same way with cultural sites. That will be part of what we do is actually set some of that up if, if we get the funding for our next project. Yeah, so um, people take photographs all the time and... No, and um, I don't know, you know, well, that's something will be up for negotiation to the extent to which it's done the archaeological way. That will be our job. Maybe people will take their photographs for their own purposes. Um, and, uh, you know, again, we'll be talking to the uh, community about, you know, the kind of databases and uh, systems that they would like to set up that we may not be able to set up ourselves, but at least getting the kind of materials and the resources there for people to do that. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure that, you know, some people might want to do that more formal kind of work. Other people might be, um, you know, de develop um, kind of protocols around, you know, the kinds of things that people might record when they're out if they if they want to when they're doing, being, doing ranger work. Um, but I think it'll be a, a kind of different different approach, I think. Anybody else? Oh, absolutely. It's been so it's been such fun. Yeah. Well, thank you, Julia. I mean, look, it's been awesome fun. Clayton, who's a fantastic young man. I think, you know, if I can get him out there because he's A, he's an ace driver and he's 
Marukulu's car was um, kind of pretty fantastic. It could, go and he, he could get that car. It didn't have four-wheel drive, so he got it up and down all those creeks without just by sheer guts, really, and a lot of speed. Um, and a lot of bouncing as well, which, um, you know, is kind of scary to watch. But he, I think, will be somebody I'd really like to work with because I think he's kind of, he's a good bushman. And they all talk about him being like that old man and he's got those bush skills. Nabby could fix the bearings on a car on the, you know, on the sand dune, you know. So he was a good bush mechanic and, um, you know, somebody who's got those kind of practical skills, uh, I think, would be good. Ben, uh, uh, the uh, slightly older man, I think there was a picture of Ben. He he wants to do that work, and then all the all the girls want to come out too. So the women that I've worked with, you know, when they they were twenty and having their first kids when I first met them, um, and they all want to come, and you know, they ring up all the time saying, "When are you coming? We miss you." So um, yeah, it'll be good, um, you know, when we get back and everybody leaves. The thing I always feel guilty about is everybody leaves their day jobs to come and work with me for a few months, you know, and um, I always feel terrible about that. But I think. People have a lot more fun out doing the stuff that we do than, you know, working for CDP or whoever it is, yeah? So, um, but yeah. Anyway, any other questions while we're sitting here? Mr. Keith, Professor Keith, I should say. Oh, okay. I know my back. I don't know when. It's fascinating. We particularly come here and you know, this is the part of the world I don't really know about that much about in terms of its um, engagement archaeology, obviously peripherally of course, but not in terms of the complexities of it. And, and you know, we've worked in the Middle East and then you know, in that kind of space that we always assumed was just normal. And then you know, nowadays all our Transformation. I was quite involved in a lot of the work there. The transformation of people's views about they were all trying to reconnect their kids to to lost. This was deeper in time, deeper in time, deeper in terms of the archaeology of this. And they were um, they started to do things like re re um, reawaken the dance rituals and to start to play, start carving again. And the things that were coming out of the ground in this amazing excavation. And, and the reason this was so amazing. Was yeah. You get the whole kind of everything you never found properly. This got people very interested. And, and the reason they wanted that arch the archaeologists there, even though they had a tradition of not trusting anthropologists and archaeologists just like here, was because all this stuff was suddenly falling out into the sea, you know, with the permafrost melting and, and uh, Yeah. So this whole package of things came together and it really convinced me that you know, that's that's it's not just about going me doing zoo archaeology and put one into understand how they were hunting in the past. These old old elders were we were showing them the number of data we had. They were basically telling us how things were, you know, where things were or whatever, because the sea ice was kind of thin at that point in time. You know, we really learned more about my subject than I did I already knew in terms of that. So that yeah, I mean that I think that's absolutely the case and I think um yeah, it's uh, and for community. I mean, for talking when we were doing all the sorting for those three or four months, you know, it was really a lot of the conversation was around language, because uh, over time, languages have becoming are becoming creolized. You know, kids go away to school, they bring English back. Um, 
everybody f has been feeling that, or oh, they're on YouTube or whatever, um, that the kind of purity of uh, Anindiliagua, which is a very difficult language, uh, is being lost, um, and that the kids are speaking too much Creole, um, which, uh, and so, and that, you know, and that, those conversations came out because we were uh, people had forgotten the names for shells or shell species or. And we were trying to, you know, these are slightly unusual ones that people don't eat anymore. Um, so we, at least we had a book, you know, a dictionary that we could look stuff up and there were pictures and things. And, you know, we had a bit of discussion around that. So it prompted, it did prompt those kind of questions about um, uh, maintenance of, of cultural practices as well. So I think that was, you know, and I think that's um, part and parcel of it. And now it's like, you know, uh, Rather than me saying, you know, is it okay? Maybe we can go and do. What about doing and trying to find out about that history of this place? You know, maybe how long ago those old people were here. It's like now. It's like when are we going to go and dig? Can we dig this up now? Sort of stuff. So it's a very. It it, it has transformed. And I think that is that thing about kind of. Even though there was a twenty year gap, it didn't feel like it. It's like I just walked straight back in, and it was like, oh my god, you know, like I don't feel like I left. I mean, you know, there's been some building and stuff, and the, as I said, the camp dogs have got smaller. But um, yeah, it was kind of it was been it's been a really uh, powerful for me, really powerful part experience in a way. Um, it's hard to underestimate that really. Um, I mean, working there transformed the way when I first went up to do my PhD. Absolutely transformed the way I thought and did archaeology. I mean, you know, we're all a bit anal about our sites. Um, you know, like ooh, we've got to have boards around it, not not step on anything. You know, like we, the, the the deposit is sacrosanct. I was in this very soft sand dune digging a midden, and I hadn't noticed, but the kids had got all the shells off the top of the midden and made a castle all the way around me. So <laughs> of all the the they've got long bums, which are uh, terebralia or terra, um, uh, yeah, mostly terebralia, and so they were sort of all sticking up. And I thought, absolutely, this to me, I thought, oh, yep. People have always lived here. The kids have always made car well, things out of shells. You know, people have rummaged in the sand, you know, and we kind of treat these sites with this kind of um, uh, respect and like, you know, ooh, don't, you know, don't touch that. That's, a, you know, archaeology, right? To the, you know, and of course it's rubbish on one level, you know, in a sense that people have always dug holes and fossicked in the sand and rolled around in the sand and played in the sand. Um, and yet we treat these kind of deposits with this sort of reverence um, that clearly was absent from the children. Um, but no, it was so, yeah, I mean, things like that, um, I think, uh, you know, and just being out in country and learning, you know, so learning, learning, learning all the time and still learning. You know, I, don't, I wouldn't ever claim to know a goddamn thing about anything, you know, when I'm out in, cu in country. But the main things are about learning to listen and learning how to do that kind of working within kind of cultural protocols. You know, I could tell more stories about, you know, being taken out of country when somebody had passed away in the middle of the night, you know, um, because, some, you know, that country was getting closed for, um, for smoking and for song later on, um, but we couldn't be, couldn't be there. And there, there were areas of the island that were uh, closed for many years because a very senior old man had passed away. So I didn't get into Central Hill f for my PhD at all, only when I went back for the postdoctoral work. So, you know, things, things like that, you know, um, kind of really different environments in which you kind of work. Um, but I think, you know, um, for me, yeah, it's helped me develop a sort of very clear uh, ethic of practice, I guess, over, over time. Anyway, any, any other questions while we're all lurking here? Or is it time to go for lunch and a, a small drink? Uh, lunch and a small drink? Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Annie. Just to say that.